Now on to our featured speakers for today. We have featured speaker, Texas Realtor Executive Vice President, Mike Barnett. Thank you for being here, Mike. Glad to be here, thank you. Let's see if we can uh, switch this share screen, uh, Nancy. Let's see here. You're sharing, Mike. You're sharing. You should see a, a bull and a, and a bear. I didn't realize that I'd be using the same uh, image that Rob has as his background. <laughs> <I'm> a buffalo. <laughs> ah, you know, longhorn buffalo. Says <laughs> the UT grid. Well, thank you. I, I, thank you, Rebecca. And, and thank you, Nancy, for, for setting this up. And, and uh, a real pleasure for, for me to be here. It's been a long time since I've... Uh, address this group probably the last time was when I was uh, the field rep in North Texas, which was over, gosh, over over 10 years ago now. So thank you for, for having me in this format. I, I really wish that we could be face to face uh, and, I, and I could visit you in person. So maybe hopefully I won't screw this up too bad and, and you'll invite me back sometime when I can make the make the trip up there. But it's, it's great to see some familiar faces and and, and also some that uh, that I hadn't gotten the opportunity to, to, to meet before. Uh, this is a great, a great opportunity and a, and a timely subject right now. Uh, you know, economic forecast. Uh, you know, flip, flip a coin. But I think that uh, I think Philip uh, pretty much gave the presentation. It's going to be a great summer, and, and things are going to are going to improve. And we'll talk a little bit about why uh, here in just a second. In addition to the uh, uh, to the details that that he gave you. <clears throat> just kind of as as an oper, I, I, you know, it's been a, a really interesting time. And you referenced uh, Mona. Uh, when the shelter in place orders uh, began and that we've all quickly shifted into uh, remote work. And this is actually the first time I've been in my office. Uh, the calendar on my desk says March 12th. We were on spring break the, uh, uh, the week before the, the shelter in place orders were, were put out. And it's, it's, this is this being the first time, and that's, I was saying earlier, obviously, because I've got a six year old and a 13 year old and a, and a, and a, Labrador retriever and a, a wife that works from home too. And I don't think you all want to hear that, but uh, have, have definitely learned a lot about, uh, uh, about the remote, remote working and, and adjusting to that lifestyle. Uh, really the lifestyle is, is, uh, is something that I think we've all, we can all agree is something that we've, we've, we've adopted or adapted to really. Uh, a couple of things that I've learned through this whole process. Uh, I'm not so bad at cutting hair, uh, I found out. I tried to cut my, my hair uh, myself, but uh, but I'm much better at cutting my son's hair. But the bigger the bigger leap of faith that uh, that came for me was allowing my 13 year old to uh, to cut my hair and, and approach my head with a with a razor. And and uh, you know it, it went okay, not as good a couple times, but uh, we got into a groove. And uh, I think I think he's uh, he's picked it up pretty well. Uh, but I, I don't think uh, that's going to be his his profession going forward. Uh, Professions going forward, what I quickly learned is that I am a terrible kindergarten teacher and I didn't even try uh, with, with the seventh grader. Uh, it, it, this gave me so much respect and admiration for, uh, for what teachers do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and, and just uh, probably some of you have the same experience, just the, the amount of care and love that we saw from our teaching community. And it, you know, I've, I've got friends that are teachers and, and, and obviously our, our, our children's teachers and in none of those conversations were, was the concern ever about what they're going through and the disruption that they're that they're experiencing. It was all about the uh, uh, the education and the well-being and the, the social well-being of, of of the kids in their classes and making sure that they uh, they were comfortable going through this process as well. And I, I know that my my kindergartner quickly wanted to fire me as his as his teacher, but uh, we got through it and I got better at it. Uh, and and he made it through the uh, made it through kindergarten. So that was. That was great. We all know that we've learned a ton about uh, Zoom. Uh, Zoom has become a, a, a verb. I uh, wish that we would have made an investment in Zoom uh, prior to all this happening. Interestingly, the office, uh, Texas Realtors in January converted our entire phone system and webinar uh, virtual meeting system over to Zoom in January. Uh, just a fortuitous uh, move that we had, had been planned and, and it's amazing what that turned into. What you're seeing on the screen right now is, is activity levels uh, on a monthly basis since January. Uh, number of meetings, in the, which are the bars, 
and then the number of participants, Texas Realtors, that we're you know face to face with in meetings that we initiate as staff. You can see uh, obviously in, in the month of May, 964 uh, Zoom meetings that uh, that that had nearly 8,800 8, participants in in there. So I was saying before this meeting started that I think it's really uh, been a way for us as Texas Realtors, not just staff, but Texas Realtors staff and leadership to really have more, uh, you know, eye to eye and face to face contact with Texas Realtors across the state on a more frequent basis, delivering great information. And, and even though it may be in a virtual format and a little bit different, it, it has certainly been engaging through this, uh, through this whole process. And finally, you know, what I learned is something that I've known all along in, in my 14 years of, of working with the association, and that's the, the passion of Texas Realtors and, and your ability to pivot no matter what, and your, your uncanny ability and, and desire and, 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 and priority that you put on being so engaged in your communities. Uh, what you're seeing here is just a couple of examples of, of things that we've, we've seen happening during uh, during the, the pandemic of, of realtors giving back to the communities and looking out, uh, looking out for others. Up in the top left, he's, that's a, a Texas realtor who was, uh, was diagnosed and recovered from uh, uh, the coronavirus and was the first person in the nation to donate plasma so that the medical professionals could use the antibodies uh, from the plasma to try to treat others with with coronavirus is just just really really amazing. Got a, a, another realtor who had just bought a brand new RV before the uh, the pandemic struck, and she actually uh, loaned that brand new RV out to a nurse uh, who was working in in emergency care uh, so that she could live in that and not expose her family to uh, uh, to the uh, uh, to the germs that perhaps she was picking up as she was as she was working in that emergency room, just over and over, and it it, it doesn't take a pandemic to to see the the care and the and the investment in your communities uh, that uh, that Texas Realtors take. It's not a, it, this whole pivot hasn't been about uh, about the financial side about it. It's about taking care of your your clients and customers and making sure that the that the needs of your neighbors are are met through this process. So from Texas Realtors, uh, a, a heartfelt thank you. Uh, and appreciation uh, for that. Let us know examples. It's important to us to be able to share these examples of what realtors uh, mean to their communities, what they're doing in times of need of their communities, and how realtors step up. So please do let us know. Share with us uh, things that, that you see, things that you're participating in terms of, uh, you know, whether they're mask uh, distribution or mask drives, or you know, there's a virtual benefit comfort, uh, concert that was put on that, that uh, went to uh, uh, support the, the area of food bank, those, those types of things. So we're really interested in, and it, it's, it's so moving to see those types of things happening across the state. So to the, to the meat of the, of the subject today, and you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I will preface by saying that I'm not an economist and, and that puts me in a great position because any economist that you talk to or that you see give a presentation from Lawrence Unit NAR to Jim Gaines or Mark Dotser or whoever here in, in Texas will always tell you that economists are 50 are, are wrong 50 percent of the time anyway. So not being an economist, I, I think I have free uh, free reign to pretty much say anything and and uh, and and be as right or uh, or, or or have forgiveness of, of being less right even than than the 50 percent. But what I, what I, the way I wanted to structure today's comments really was. I think we need to understand where we came from before the pandemic uh, to really get a context on where we're going. And I think, I think Philip really alluded to that in, in, uh, in his comments earlier about the optimism that we have going into, uh, into the summer and into the rest of the year. And it's really based on the fundamentals of, of what was going on uh, pre-pandemic. And then I want to talk a little bit about, obviously, about some of the things that, that happened in the, in the financial markets, in the real estate markets uh, during uh, during that pandemic, what what it's doing to uh, to state revenues, we'll talk a little bit about that as well, and then and then get into a little bit of of forecasting, and that's really where I'm going to lean on some of these economists that uh, that we have heard from, and 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 look at some of the data that that we've we've seen uh, coming through as well. Pre-pandemic, uh, I, I think from a financial perspective, from a from an economic perspective, it's it's really important to to know where we came from, the the, the fundamentals of our economy. Uh, we're super, super strong. What you see here is, is historic bull runs, and that's a growth in the, in the stock markets. 
we just we just ended the longest bull run in the history of the of the market uh, in March uh, at 11 years and one month, uh, and that beats the next longest one was was 7.8 years there in, in the 90s. Uh, but by far uh, strong growth in the economy, the fundamentals, especially especially in Texas. Um, we're, we're strong. You can see the consumer confidence index uh, comparing Texas to to the United States. This is how, you know, the basically the pulse of how consumers are feeling about what's going on, and which leads to their uh, uh, leads to their willingness to to spend money and keep that economy going. You can see that Texas has always outpaced uh, the United States and, and and continues to. But obviously, uh, and and we can look at that a, a little bit later. But obviously, in March. With the shutdown in the economy, that was was drastically impacted. But we we did see uh, uh, in the last month a, a sharp increase uh, back. And actually, the U U.S. Com consumer confidence index was pretty flat from where it, uh, where it dropped to in March. But Texas uh, Texas actually is is has spiked upward uh, far beyond what the U.S. did. And it's it's that resolve of Texans. It's that optimism of Texas. It's how. Uh, the pandemic has been handled here in Texas, uh, and and what what our how the, the the strength of our of our economy and our ability probably to uh, to recover faster and be hit uh, less severely than the rest of the country. Unemployment, I think, is the is the story of the day uh, in terms of the impact of the uh, of the pandemic, uh, and and even pre you know, uh, Jim Gaines told me the other day that typically you know. Five to six percent is the typical unemployment rate, a healthy unemployment rate for the for the nation, or historically was about the about the average or or, or sweet spot for unemployment. Uh, in Texas, you know, we we've been at three and a half percent. The U.S. was at three and a half percent going into uh, the pandemic. The Fort Worth the Fort Worth side of of your metropolitan statistical area, that metropolitan division, which Denton County is a part of, is actually at three point two percent, just astoundingly low. Uh, low unemployment levels uh, going into the, into the pandemic, and we'll look at uh, at what happened uh, as a re result of that. Looking at at, at at real estate markets going into it, we had continuing record breaking uh, record breaking um, uh, 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 real estate market statistics. What you're seeing here is is the first quarter of uh, of the of 2020. Uh, sales were up 15% year over year. Uh, median price growth was up 1.7% over uh, year over year over the first quarter of 2019. Um, sales were this is this is year over year. Uh, 2020 is in yellow, uh, 2019 is in red, and 2018 is in blue. This is closed sales year over year. So you can see even through well, I've only got this one going through March, but even through April, we'll see in just a little bit. Uh, sales were outpacing uh, 2018 and, and 2019, and this is this is Denton County. So, uh, on on course for another another record breaking year, and you all know that uh, you know better than we do from looking at statistics. Uh, growth in our membership, obviously, you know, we ended the year with uh, 2019 with 126,000 realtors. Uh, Trek ended the year, that's a, that was after several years of five to nine percent growth in our in our membership levels. Uh, 148,000, almost 149,000 licensees in the state of Texas. Uh, continued growth there. We'll talk a little bit about that, but we're not we're we're seeing a slower rate of growth. We're still in, even with even with uh, license, licensing testing uh, halting for a while, and a lot of the education and, and other activities halting. Still seeing growth in our in our membership numbers uh, even through even through the the, the pandemic. Now going into uh, into the year next year, uh, how much will will the market uh, dynamics impact the number of realtors we have going into next year? We just drafted our first draft of the budget and are actually budgeting for a three percent three to four percent decrease in the number of of realtor members. NAR budgeted at at a five percent drop. In uh, in realtor counts, uh, but have already backtracked a little bit on that to uh, with a little bit more optimism in terms of what uh, what those numbers are are going to look like. Then obviously we hit uh, we we hit the pandemic and we hit the the you know, the shelter in place orders. We hit the shutdown of the of the economy. This is actually the first the first time in history that that 
the government essentially mandated a recession uh, for the for the economy. Uh, really, really interesting to, to look at. And I think it really plays into what that forecast is, is that this wasn't because of the fundamentals of the economy going into it. This was not something that was that was either driven by uh, financial markets. It wasn't driven by the, the, the housing markets. This was a just a, a pause that was mandated by uh, by the government in, in, in response to uh, in response to the uh, to the uh, outbreak of the of the virus, and it'll be interesting to see uh, you know with the with the actions that were taken and we and as we're start as we're opening the economy back up, some of the actions that were that were taken by the by the federal government and the state government to uh, kind of uh, offer <clears throat> offer a safe landing uh, to that shutdown, how that'll trickle out and 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 uh, and play out in the in the recovery efforts. Uh, but it's it's just interesting to note that 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 it was the, the first time. This timeline here uh, kind of shows you how quickly all that happened. With you know, it was it was the the first of the year when we really first even started hearing about uh, uh, the coronavirus, and it, it was you know two months later, two and a half months later that uh, uh, that the entire economy was was shut down. You see what happened to the uh, to the to the uh, financial markets in that short period of time. Um, uh, between March 23rd and February 19th, March 23rd being the, the high in the in the S and P index, at least a 34% hit to that uh, to that market. We're going to look at this in a little bit more uh, detail later in terms of historically what's happened after uh, drops like this. Uh, but that gives you a little bit of perspective how fast that drop was. But you also see since that uh, since that date, since March 23rd, uh, that the the market has largely has largely rebounded, and there are a few things to take into consideration uh, there as well. A couple of the congressional actions, just to give a, a little bit of perspective, because it does play into uh, it does play into what uh, what recovery looks like and and uh, things that are impacting uh, the way we're going to recover. But you know, March 18th, uh, as we go into that shutdown, uh, the Families First Corona Response Response Act helping employers in terms of what are you going to what uh, what's the impact to your em employees and your businesses on this thing? They passed the CARES Act, which, uh, uh, among other things, with $2 trillion, among other things, extended unemployment uh, benefits, uh, 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 extended those also to the self-employed, which, in which includes realtors, a, a, a lift that uh, the NAR was, uh, was really instrumental in, in being able to, to ensure that Congress understood uh, the way your business has worked and and, uh, and and being able to extend those unemployment uh, benefits to um, uh, to self-employed uh, that funding was uh, was the paycheck protection program funding was was actually replenished in April 21st and it's also interesting to know that of the 660 billion dollars that was in that uh, replenishment uh, fund uh, to fund uh, to, to replenish the, the PPP fund, only 510 billion dollars of that has been used, and so even over the you know over the course of now a, a month and a half, uh, there was so much demand up front. Uh, over the course of that month and a half, we haven't even used uh, you know uh, 100 and some odd billion dollars of that of that fund. That tells you uh, how businesses acted quickly or braced themselves uh, early. And how they're planning for recovery. There were a lot of uh, a lot of pieces of that uh, of that that perhaps cost some businesses not to uh, uh, not to take advantage of it. The, there was a lack of clarity in, in what the what the rules were, lack of clarity in what was going to be forgiven and what wasn't going to be forgiven. So I think that it really uh, those things kind of play into uh, you know that uh, uh, what's left in that fund as as well. <clears throat> yesterday, uh, yesterday, a lot of that, some of that was resolved, uh, uh, and the uh, Senate finally passed what's called the PPP Flexibility Act, and that is providing some, not only providing more clarity in the rules, but also uh, offering more flexibility in the rules that businesses have more time to use those funds, uh, that there's a longer uh, 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 expiration uh, period on on the uh, on those provisions within that plan. So it, that comes as a welcome. Uh, a welcome piece of news to the business community that 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 flexibility act was passed yesterday by the Senate should be uh, signed by the president today um, or or very soon. Texas Realtors obviously went into uh, overdrive in terms of uh, ensuring that that the industry and use Texas Realtors 
uh, had the tools that you need as you were pivoting and 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 uh, and getting business back to the to to what the new normal was for your business over the last couple of months, making sure that you had the tools in terms of new new forms, new model certifications, and resources to guide, uh, resource guides to help you. Uh, know the best practices and, and giving you tools to work with with your clients and, and customers. Again, going back to unemployment, this slide really gives you a, a, a true perspective on how drastic uh, the impact from an un unemployment side uh, of the spectrum uh, was with the with the shutdown and then also the, the extension of those uh, unemployment benefits and essentially uh, what could be considered an artificial, not a fake, but an artificial, um, um, perhaps short-term uh, unemployment uh, situation that we have, we hope. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But 2.2 2 million claims from March March 15th to, to, to May 30, uh, 23rd, uh, increasing that 3.5% uh, unemployment rate up to 12.8% uh, percentage points, uh, which is obviously a, a record. You can see on here those dotted lines where uh, it compares to other events that that uh, that resulted in high unemployment rates. Hurricane Harvey in 2017 here in Texas, uh, Great Recession in, in 2008 where those un unemployment numbers were compared to uh, where they where they were. The good news is that you saw that spike uh, and, and, and see it coming down. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. In Denton County, this gives you a, a perspective on uh, unemployment claims there locally. In Denton County, uh, you saw that uh, that spike or the highest number of unemployment claims being made the week of uh, April 4th, uh, with nearly 11,000 claims being made. Over this time period, this, uh, uh, this uh, several month time period, that's uh, just over 50,000 unemployment claims compared to just under 4,800 last year. Um, uh, just to give a little bit of a perspective and, and view into that. This is the this is the employment numbers for the Fort Worth Arlington Metro Division. Again, that's the west uh, west half of the of the Metroplex, uh, including um, including uh, Denton County. There, uh, just a, a, a huge drop in those employment numbers. Uh, from from where you were uh, before to uh, to where we are today, that that number only went through uh, uh, through March. The other piece of the of the puzzle and the impact that plays into what the what the forecast is is how the and sets the stage really for a, a difficult legislative session next year is the impact of revenue to the to the state's coffers. What you see over on the left is total sales tax collections in the state. The red line being 2020. Uh, compared to, we'll look at uh, the yellow line being being 2019 for April, uh, there was uh, about 2.6 billion dollars in sales tax revenue, which is a drop, uh, uh, quite quite a drop from uh, uh, from before, 9.3 percent down from 2019. Uh, over on the right, uh, this was illustrating kind of the double double whammy that that the state of Texas uh, underwent. Because aside from coronavirus, we were already seeing the the, the, the price wars over oil and oil, uh, oil and gas, and seeing that revenue drop off as well. About 57 percent of the uh, of the state's uh, state revenue comes from from sales tax, and we'll, we'll take a look at, at at some of the other pieces as well. But give you a little bit of perspective on setting up uh, uh, what right now looks like a very 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 difficult uh, doomsday scenario for. Uh, for legislative uh, budget making. The sales tax revenue, uh, as, like I said, was down 9.3%. Uh, actually, let me, let me see if I've got, no, I don't. Uh, we'll get to that in just a little bit, uh, coming back to that. But motor vehicle sales tax down 45%, motor fuel tax down 12%, uh, natural gas tax, uh, production tax down 48%, oil production tax down 45%, hotel occupancy tax down 63%. Uh, this this one is interesting because I think it defies uh, defies a little bit of our own logic. Alcoholic beverage taxes were down 50 55 percent from uh, from April of 2019. I think we all all assumed that everybody was uh, was ending their day with uh, with with <laughs> with some drinks after being on Zoom all day long and dealing with kids and kids and pets and and everything else during the day. Uh, but it, but I, it was largely driven by the mixed beverage gross receipts and sales taxes, which were down 58%. So bars were shut down, uh, mixed drinks taxes that, that are exclusive to bars and other and, and restaurants 
uh, really was the was the was the brunt of that um, uh, of that reduction. Uh, excise taxes on on beer were up 16 percent, and wine excise excise taxes were up nine percent from 2019. So that's kind of where going back to our, our own consumer habits at, at home versus uh, not being able to go out to um, uh, to our favorite watering hole or or restaurant. This, this is a, a chart that I've been keeping up with since the beginning of this thing. Uh, and this shows from, a, from showing time, this shows the number of, of showings that were occurring. This is for uh, the state of Texas. So you can really see uh, where that March 10th, March 13th uh, time period, uh, the showings really started dropping off. Uh, we we're unclear as to whether, uh, whether or how showings could be done. There was a pivot largely towards virtual showings. Uh, and you see how quickly uh, you as Texas realtors made that pivot and adjusted to not only uh, the new norm of what you could and couldn't do, but also embracing new, new technology to be able to, 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 uh, to work on behalf of, uh, of your clients and customers. And, and it, it was early May that we actually saw uh, showings above the weekly average for, for 2019. So just a, a really good perspective. And it plays well into uh, our forecast as well, because uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a little bit, but hitting that, hitting that trough there in, in, uh, in late March, uh, you all know, you know, days on market in terms of, of how long it takes from a, you know, from a, from a time of listing until you, until you have a closing really plays into what we're going to see in, uh, in our May uh, market statistics, but then also June going forward as we see uh, these increases in showings and, we, and, and increases in, in activity. Uh, just to kind of close out this section on, on what, what was happening, these are year to date, and, and this is important because everybody sees the, the monthly statistics and they saw, they saw the, the April statistics and, and seeing that you know, uh, that uh, closings were way down and, and prices were steady and, and the inventory uh, uh, continuing to go off the, off the market. What's really important to keep into perspective is what year to date looks like uh, compared to 2019 and not just the uh, March, April and, and what we will see in the, in the May statistics coming up. So looking at, at year to date, uh, you know, up 6.2% over, over 2019, median prices up, active listings. You all know that there's an inventory uh, an inventory problem uh, uh, happening and, and is probably getting exacerbated by the uh, uh, by the pandemic as well. But but do do keep in, in perspective what the year to date uh, statistics look like uh, instead of reacting always to uh, the narrative around what happens in a in a particular month. Uh, local associations will be um, uh, will be uh, provided uh, May market statistics uh, probably ne early next week. Uh, we're probably going to see that May was a, a, a hard hit month in terms of, of closings and inventory. Going back to that showing slide where we kind of saw the, the dip in activity uh, in, in March and April, that's obviously going to um, obviously going to play out in, in May closings as well. So moving into our into our, our forecast section here. Uh, Quickly, and I, I know my, my time is running, running out. I don't want to, to cut Dr. Wilson off uh, or cut any of, of his time out, but uh, just, just really quickly, looking at the financial markets, again, this was the, this was the fastest drop in recovery in the, in the stock market in history. What you're seeing here is, is other notable, um, uh, notable declines in the market, uh, recessions, those sorts of things, and, and how long it took in terms of days to get from the peak of the market where it started to the bottom of the market. In 2020, you'll see here that it was only 23 days that, we, that it took to hit. That, that, that goes to, to speak to kind of the uh, uh, self-imposed really uh, uh, recession that we, that we put ourselves in because we had to stop the, uh, the activity in the, in the market. Uh, some of these others you'll see that, that we recognize that we've all lived through the 1987 was, was the next shortest at 71 days in the 90s, 62 days, but a lot of times uh, they're, they're much, much longer than that. This is the ugliest chart that I have, uh, but what it does, it shows how we've rebounded in terms of how those, how those other recessions played out in terms of the number of days and what that activity was. But the important thing is to look at this red line, uh, which is our current, uh, current year and how how quickly it went down, 
and then how quickly it's it's rebounding. Does that mean that it's uh, that it's only going to keep rebounding? Uh, maybe, maybe not. It really, there are a lot of factors that are going to that are still yet to play out in terms of um, what could cause you know another another severe downturn uh, if there's no vaccine that uh, that everybody expects early. Uh, early 20, uh, 2021, if, if that doesn't come to fruition or doesn't come to fruition uh, quickly enough, if there's a resurgence of the, of the virus that's severe enough that causes another economic shutdown, uh, you know, that's obviously going to send us into another, another tailspin. Uh, the election is going to have an impact, and I'm not getting into, into politics, and the association doesn't, does not play a role or take a position in presidential politics, but historically, uh, what the uh, portfolio managers and economists will tell you is that uh, uh, that the expectation would be that if if a Democrat is is elected president, that the market would react to that. Would it cause a recession? No, but the market would react to it and would uh, would 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 cause a, a bit of a disruption until things stabilize stabilize out. That typically happens uh, historically. Again, not not getting into politics. I showed you uh, what is setting up to be a very difficult legislative session on top of a redistricting session, which is always uh, uh, which always adds to the excitement. But this is this is the distribution. This is the money that the state has to work with to build their what in, in 18 was a 55 billion dollar <clears throat> uh, 55 billion dollar budget, 57 percent of its sales tax. We've seen 9.3 percent drop in sales tax. Uh, motor vehicle sales and, um, and and fuels taxes makes a big chunk of that, and then oil and gas together is is uh, is an important part of that budget as well. And, and both of those are around a forty five percent forty five percent drop in, in those. So, you know that's that it'll it'll yet to be uh, seen what happens in the rest of the year, how quickly the recovery is, what the activity level is. Uh, but suffice it to say that with a two month pause in the economy. Uh, there will be some difficult, uh, difficult discussions as the state builds a builds a budget uh, for the next uh, for the next biennium, and know that uh, you know when when things like this happen, everything is on the table. So you know that Texas Realtors will be there day and night, ensuring that uh, that that uh, they don't make up budget shortfalls on the back of of the industry and and, and consumers. Unemployment. Uh, you know, we, we saw what the uh, what the unemployment numbers look like. We do expect uh, that that as businesses reopen, we're going to see a, a pretty sharp decrease in that unemployment rate, uh, and then it'll it'll be a sharp a sharp decrease, and then it'll and then it'll linger. It won't get all the way back down to normal levels uh, with that initial decrease in, in unemployment. There will still be uh, folks that are are not reemployed. Uh, folks that hang on, uh, unemployment benefits were extended for a longer period of time. They, the amount of time that uh, that the pandemic uh, unemployment compensation uh, benefits has already been extended twice. Normally, it's 26 weeks. It was then it was uh, extended another 13 weeks, and then even I believe this week was extended another 13 weeks to 52 weeks of, of eligibility for for unemployment. Insurance, but we do expect that the un unemployment rate will get back down to around that normal rate of, of five to six percent, perhaps not uh, not that three point five percent rate, but um, but slowly. Lawrence Yoon uh, uh, made a uh, made a statement. It's, a, it's about a three minute video on on NAR's website or NAR's Twitter account, uh, where he's making his uh, observations and and forecasts for. Uh, for the future on a national level, obviously, but these are important things, and I think that they're that they're observations that'll uh, that'll play out here in Texas as well. <clears throat> Notice that spending has increased on home improvement during the during the pandemic, and so does that mean? Uh, and and uh, historically, when that happens, that means that they're getting that consumers are getting ready to put houses on the market. Uh, does that? In this case, does that mean they're going to put my houses on the market, or in this case, does it mean that people have time on their hands, got to see more of their homes, and saw things that they don't like? Uh, that'll be uh, yet to be played out as well. Uh, he mentioned that low to mid price home demand, uh, demand for low to mid price uh, homes is exceptionally strong. We've seen that in Texas over the last couple of years as the inventory gets lower and lower, but obviously, uh, as the pent up demand is there and, and folks start, start hitting the markets again. Uh, there's going to be that's going to put that into a very very competitive uh, position for those low to mid price affordable affordable homes. 
taking advantage of the low mortgage rates uh, with the um, uh, with the stimulus package that was put into place, the expectation from the from the economists is that there, we could see some uh, some inflation happen because of that. It's good to uh, to 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 talk to your clients about locking in those those uh, rates while they while they are at lows. Uh, you know, both uh, both Dr. Yoon and Dr. Gaines say that that the mortgage rates are are likely to remain low. Uh, but what does that do with the with the purchase power of a dollar if we if we start seeing uh, that stimulus uh, caused inflation. Um, he's expecting um, uh, increase in sales to be as high as 10 to 15 percent. That's a higher number than, than than I've heard, especially on the national level. But really basing that on this pent up demand uh, that, that he feels like there has been just a, a pause in activity. Uh, and there are folks out there and we'll see that in Dr. Gaines' uh, uh, comments here in just a second and that, that we'll see price increase as well. Uh, talked to Dr. Dr. Gaines at the Real Estate Center. He's the chief economist at the Real Estate Center. I talked to him two days ago and, and agrees largely with, with much of that, 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 that there is pent up demand, that, that, that those with jobs uh, that have remained with jobs have been at home not spending money and those that have been in the, uh, of the appetite to get into the, into the housing market or, or, or move from, uh, from their home into a different home, they've had time to save money over the last couple over the last couple months. These are your not your not your entry level, not your first time home, home buyers. Maybe that that are in those jobs that uh, that are most affected by the unemployment and may may even get hit harder after uh, the reopening and they're not rehired. But but your 30 and 40 year olds uh, that are in that either in that move up market or are still in that first time home buyer position, uh, but have had that opportunity to save some money over the last. Uh, the last couple uh, uh, last couple months, um, DFW he, he the DFW area uh, he commends uh, and, and and mentions that it it's in a much better position from a diversified economy uh, than the rest of the state, particularly Houston uh, and other areas that are very dependent upon oil and gas that have been hit hard by this and that that double whammy. Uh, Dallas the Fort Worth Dallas Fort Worth area is going to become very attractive for corporate headquarters. And other types of, uh, of industries that are that are flying from other states that aren't recovering as quickly as as Texas. We remain a, a low cost uh, low cost state for businesses and, and, and property, uh, and, and there may be some some flight from that. How is the remote working environment going to impact uh, the ability of workers who may not who may work in those uh, in those uh, metro areas? To be able to work remotely and choose where they where they get to live, so an area like a Denton would be a would be a great place uh, for you know somebody that 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 has had to work and live in has had to live in Dallas because they've got to, had to go into an office, but now they're going to have the opportunity to work remotely and they can choose where they uh, where they want to live. Uh, Dr. Gaines all, always mentions that uh, that in any of these economic recessions that Texas because of our uh, because of our uh, business climate, because of our low tax uh, rates, uh, has always been not hit as hard during re recessions and always been, been quicker to come back. So I, I think that's great news uh, for our area. Very quickly, I know my, my, my time is up, uh, but I think relevant to, uh, uh, to you guys. NAR just released a study that they did back in May and, and with a couple third parties that did this, talking to consumers about What's, gonna, what's the impetus? What's going to cause you to get back into your daily routine? What's it going to take to get back into your daily routine? Uh, what types of assurances uh, in, included in their questioning was uh, consumers uh, and open houses? What, what would those who indicated that they are interested in at some point uh, attending an open house, getting into the housing market, <clears throat> they asked those folks in this slide here, well, when is that going to happen? How long do you think that's going to happen? Uh, you know, almost a third of them said immediately, but 75% said within the next three months, uh, we, you know, given that there's going to be some assurances of, of safety uh, uh, in, in, in that environment, uh, we, we want to get back into, uh, back into the fold. So what would it take? These are the top, um, uh, these are the top things that they said that it would, it would take to give them a comfort level uh, uh, of, of visiting an open house. Uh, Top one being requiring uh, face masks. The second being physical, uh, physical social distancing of, of six feet. And you can you can read the uh, the other pieces there. This is on uh, on NAR's NAR's website. If you want to take a look at the at the full study, all this is really to say is that there there is optimism out there. There's consumer optimism, uh, and there is optimism to to return to uh, uh, to to uh, 
to an active market again. Again, this is going back to looking at, at year to date. This is this is month to month uh, where uh, closed sales and and median price has been uh, uh, through April. We were still still up in April, even though we had had a, a month and a half pause on uh, on our activity. Very last slide, I promise. Uh, we've been watching during the uh, during the the pandemic pandemic, we began watching MLS activity on a, on a weekly day basis just to see how it was being impacted and what that recovery, recovery was look like. This is, this is Denton County from, uh, from, from your MLS. Uh, the, on the left is, is pending listing. So obviously in that, in that time period when uh, the market was shut down, not only from your ability to, to have clarity on how to, uh, how to engage in, in real estate, but also from a uh, uh, from a consumer perspective of just sitting on the sidelines for a while. But you can see that uh, that how quickly that that moved back up. Red is is 2020, blue is 2019, and, and gold is is 2018. So you can already see that we're back at a higher uh, a higher pending listing uh, a pending status than uh, than we were in either of those years. Uh, and this should reflect well on our on our monthly uh, on our on our monthly. Um, uh, reports as well. New list, new listings is over on the right, so you can see us coming back. You know, obviously that drop uh, during the during the pandemic uh, of that dip there, but coming back strong. And 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 all that goes back to say is that while May uh, May is probably not going to look great in terms of closed sales, we're going to see year over year closed sales uh, down in May, and that's just that that's that time period, that 60 day time period of those. Uh, houses that uh, properties that didn't get listed in that March time frame, not getting closed in in May. But then we do see our expectation is that June uh, will be uh, up year over year again, and that the rest of the year will get uh, will get largely back on uh, back on track. And <clears throat> I thank you for your time, and I know that I've I've gone over just a little bit, but uh, uh, hopefully some information you can work with. Happy to take any. Uh, uh, any questions uh, later, or by email, or or by phone call? Happy to, happy to to uh, to visit with anyone. So thank you for for giving the opportunity here. Thank you very much for all the excellent information and updates. You definitely did a, a great job. Covered all the questions I came to the meeting with. So great job as always. We do have two questions I think are um, important for this body. Has the pandemic caused a dip uh, or change in membership with our Texas realtors? And uh, do we have plans regarding our uh, conference in San Antonio later this year? Two, two, <clears throat> two great questions. <clears throat> membership levels. Uh, I'll, pref I'll preface it by saying that, uh, you know, Recent years, uh, four or five years ago, we were seeing growth rates of eight, nine, nine, nine percent or so year over year. Those are huge, uh, uh, huge growth numbers. Over the last three or four years, we've seen those starting to moderate. We're still in a growth uh, in a growth pattern, but we've seen those moderate down to more uh, five percent, four percent. Right now, uh, year over year, we're at about three uh, percent. So we're still in that growth pattern. Uh, we do expect that that three percent is is current, we, and that is with um, with the testing being suspended uh, at the trek level and some of those activities, and, and obviously what's what's happening in the market, uh, not seeing new uh, new folks come back in. April uh, April had uh, pretty low new member uh, in terms of brand new realtor members. Uh, join, but then we saw that increase back in March. So folks are coming back in. The big question is going to be the long-term economic impact in terms of the of the market activity, uh, whether those folks that are that are casually in the uh, in the business, uh, or those that, uh, that that aren't able to recover as much as they feel they need to, uh, will that have an impact in in twenty? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, in, in twenty one. Like I said, we're budgeting for about a 3% decrease uh, next year in, in membership levels, um, but it's, it's really uh, yet to be seen. Conference, uh, another great question, and I wish I had a better answer for you. Uh, the, we are looking at every, every option right now. Your leadership team uh, and your executive board uh, is looking at every, every option. I see Tim is on the, on the call right now. Uh, the, uh, the executive board has a meeting next week uh, to preliminarily uh, look at all the options 
the facts and the details. We did a, we did a survey of, of members who uh, have been to the last couple uh, uh, conferences, took their pulse on level of concern about the, uh, uh, about the safety of attending the conference, whether they would attend the conference uh, in person. Uh, so the, the, uh, the executive board will be considering all those, all those facts and details but then may not make a decision until later in the month. I uh, want to have the opportunity to uh, give them some time to, t to take and consider uh, those facts and opinions of, of members and balance that really with the health and safety. Our, whether, it's a, whether it's in person or it's not in person, the determining factor, and I think Tim would tell you this as, as your regional vice president, the determining factor in this whole thing is the health and safety of our, of our members. We all want to get together. We all, I would love to be up there and Denton with you today, and we'd like to be with you in San Antonio, but ultimately it's gotta be a decision based on whether it's the right thing to do, whether it's the, the, the safe and healthy thing to do. Uh, we particularly want to be there to celebrate the 100th year anniversary of Texas Realtors, uh, but ultimately uh, the executive board will be making that decision soon. And so we're in a bit of a, of a, of a standby right now, standby wait and see. There will be a conference we're mandated by, uh, by our bylaws to, to hold a conference. It's just a matter of whether it's a fully in-person conference, a fully uh, uh, technology-based virtual conference, or whether it's some mixture of the two. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Mike. So very helpful, and we appreciate you more than you know. Anytime. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to our next speaker, the Essened, Dr. Jamie Wilson from the Denton Independent School District. Welcome, Jamie. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone's having a, having a good day. I'll just wave. That way you don't have to say hello. We've got our new Zoom protocol going for sure. Um, hope everyone's doing well um, in, this, in this interesting time. Uh, never thought I would be, be speaking to a computer screen camera um, so much of the day, each and every day. So um, just wanted to come on and, and, and I appreciate the invitation. And I, I see that we've got, you know, 35 or so folks here and there. And I don't know if I can, if I can share my screen or not. So if, I'll try and see if it, see how it goes here. Um, So let's see here, Mike, can you give me a thumbs up? Cause you happen to still be your face on my screen if you can see that. There you go, good. All right, so um, I will email this presentation to you all. Uh, this is our quarterly growth report that we do with the school district every year. Some of the, some of the information that we, we, I say every year, we do it every quarter with the school district, with our board of trustees. We're having it on our agenda for this, this Tuesday night helps us in our planning for school siting and those kinds of things. Um, a lot of this Mike talked about in his presentation, so I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time in that, but I, I think it is important that you all recognize and know that these are things that our locally elected board of trustees look at when it comes to planning. Um, and since you all have to ask, answer the questions quite often about uh, property taxes and how much property tax taxes are and how that impacts mortgages and payments, it's important for you to know a little bit about how this plays, plays into that. So um, you've seen some of the impacts to COVID-19, the change in employment. Mike talked about this some, and, and I have a little piece over here about the different sectors um, that where you see where the job loss was. Um, I think when you look at restaurants um, and, and retail issues, specifically here in the Denton area with our, with, in, in the city of Denton perspective, respectively with TWU and UNT being such a, a vibrant part of what we do, those restaurant jobs kind of went away when our students went away too, right? So in addition to the COVID, you have, you have that piece. Um, and you can see some of those statistics that, that Mike talked about as well. Um, unemployment, unemployment pieces, um, you see that across the state as, as you work through some of these items. Um, and it's no, to no surprise, the Dallas region and the Austin region are two of the markets that are um, probably the uh, most resistant to having huge downswings in, in, in their employment rate simply because of how much we're growing and what that looks like. So um, that last bullet in there, I think, is really important. Texas has five of the top 10 most recession resistant cities in America. That is huge for us, especially, I think, in the real estate market and frankly, in the public school uh, sector that, that we actually have that working, working for us. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that we haven't lost a section of our workforce um, and those jobs that we lost has a negative impact on our economy from that, that sales tax perspective, uh, which, is, which is how our state is funded. So um, you, can, you, can, you can look through that. This next piece um, is the, the Texas Builders Survey about starts and contract sales as of April 27th. Um, and you can look and see about where everyone is with current starts and projections versus their 2020 plans. Um, and then you can see where sales are compared to the prior weeks. And so um, we kind of look at this from an inventory perspective in the school district when it comes to forecasting students and student growth. And that leads us to the next slide, which talks about state enrollment trends. Um, you can see that in 2010, we had about 4.8 million students in Texas, and now we're up to 5.5, just under 5.5 million. Um, so, you know, we, we grew about 62,000 um, students in 1920 in the state. Um, the interesting part about that is of those 62,000 students, 90% of those move into about 80 school districts. So, Basically, 90% of that 62,000 is moving into Denton, Frisco, Prosper, McKinney, uh, Little Elm, uh, you know, those north, just in Northwest, those, those areas um, where you see new home growth and you see, you see some of those pieces. Um, and you can see what the enrollment change has been. We've leveled off a little bit. If you look, if you look right before the last quote unquote recession of 2011, we were at about 98,000 students a year growth, and we've, we've, we've kind of, you know, gone down a little bit from that. Um, and, and then you see it starting to go back up a little bit as, as years move forward. Um, this is a big issue for us across the state is charter schools in Texas. With this uh, 336,000 students in Texas attend charter schools, a lot of people don't know that a charter school is a public school, but there's not an elected, elected governing body that oversees those dollars um, from a fiscal transparency perspective. Um, our state spends about $700 million more than a traditional public school spends on its students. Those 336,000 students you see there in charter schools, um, those, those charter schools get about $2,000 more per student than the local public schools get. Um, and if that $700, $700 million um, if they even got the same level of funding as traditional public schools, property taxes could probably be reduced another penny or two across the state. And a lot of people don't know where that money comes from from charter schools. They don't have their own tax rate. It all comes from the state. Um, and, but the state reduces or increases what local school districts get based upon local property values. So this is a, this is a direct uh, connection to property tax rates across the state when we, when we choose to fund those schools differently. Um, here's region 10 and 11. Those are education terms per se, but you can see the, um, the five-year enrollment growth. Region 10 and 11 is basically Fort Worth and Westward all the way out here to Strong, one of the best chicken fried steak places in the state of Texas, if you've never been to Mary's and Strong. Um, and then if you go all the way over here to the east, you'll see uh, Commerce and Canton. So this is a big swath of the DFW region, which is region 10 and 11. 10 and 11. Our school district, we've added approximately 4,000 kids in the last five years, and we're the second fastest growing district in Region 11, and you can see it's us in Northwest. So those of you on this call, Denton and Wise County, that's the two school districts <laughs> that, that uh, Northwest and Denton are in. And then of course you have Decatur right there, and you can see what the enrollment change is um, for these different pieces. Um, interesting enough, look at Dallas and look at Fort Worth. Um, those districts have the largest number, if you look at these maps right here, these charter school stars. The reason you see their, their enrollment trends going down in those areas, Garland, Dallas, Irving, Cedar Hill, Arlington, Fort Worth, is there's a, there's a lot of charter schools that are going into these areas. And so that's why you see their enrollment going down. Um, home ranking reports for the first quarter. You can see we're just behind Prosper ISD. So you can, I use it from a Denton ISD perspective. I know most people on this call are not just Denton ISD, but I do know you represent clients in these districts, Prosper, Denton, Frisco, Northwest, probably Eagle Mountain, Saginaw, Louisville, Little Elm, uh, McKinney, uh, 
maybe even getting as far as Royce City and Wiley. But you can begin to see, if you look at these top top ten, Little Elm, Louisville, Eagle Mountain, Saginaw, Northwest, Frisco, Denton, and Prosper, um, everyone except for Forney and um, Dallas are – are in, in our region, right, in, in, the, in, the, in the region of, of the northern DFW area. So um, pretty interesting there. For the, for the Denton ISD, you can see that you see these annual starts and the annual closings. The inventory is about, about right for that. And you see the, ver the vacant developed lots, and then you see the futures. So of all of these school districts, all these different places, the place that you want to be a realtor the most is in our region. When you think about, we have 35,000 future lots in the Denton ISD. Um, we even do these by uh, elementary attendance zone. So people always ask me, Dr. Wilson, why do you do this by elementary attendance zone? And the reason is this tells me where I'm going to need to secure future elementary school sites and additional schools based upon where the future lots are. So you can pretty much look at this and you see that Borman Elementary, which is really in the core of Denton, it doesn't have any annual starts, it doesn't have any annual closings, doesn't have any under construction, doesn't have any inventory, vacant development lots, so it's zeros all the way across, but it has 16,000 futures. Anybody want to guess what that is? That's Hunter and Cole Ranch, right? It's currently, if someone lives in Hunter or Cole Ranch, which is the latest Hillwood development, and Stratford property just south of the airport, right now that attendance zone, if you live there, you go to Mormon, right? But there's 16,000 lots planned for that just west of I-35, so that's where we start looking for schools and school sites. You can pretty much be rest assured that's the location where we'll have a high school or two and those kinds of things. Um, then if you look down here to Union Park, this is the one that has the highest annual starts. Union Park is our farthest east subdivision it is also a Hillwood property. And so you can see what their closing rate is and how those things are working. Um, and they have 5,000 lots in the Union Park attendance zone. So these ones that have large numbers of futures in each attendance zone are places where you can pretty much be rest assured at some point in the future, um, there'll be attendance boundaries adjustments. And that's where that 35,000 future lots is added up by attendance zones. So we divide it into, into geographic regions. This slide is probably the, uh, one of the most telling because it's color coded with active developments. So that Borman zone I told you about earlier, you see over here, this is west of I-35. Um, and Borman Elementary School is actually right in here, right? Um, it's inside the, inside the 235s, but this entire area is zoned to Borman. The green area that's farthest to the, uh, to the west there, that's Robeson Ranch. Um, then you can see where all the different active areas are and subdivisions across the, across the district. So um, gives you a pretty good idea of that. Multifamily, we have to factor that piece in as well. Um, these are transfers in and out by district. Uh, these are the charter campuses. Remember I told you earlier that um, Fort Worth and Dallas that were light in color. See, these are all the charter schools. Um, and, you know, we don't have a big a big representation in Denton that pretty much stops at the lake, except for Lake Dallas. Um, they have two charter schools and they're, they are in um, a very small nine square mile area. Um, and so you can, you can see where these, where these schools are and, and how those things work. Um, it's interesting to me that there's a couple of charter schools in this section of Louisville um, that our state is funding at $2,000 more per kid when all the schools here are high A's. This is the Flower Mound area. Um, that's the Founders Academy right there. So just interesting um, one way or the other. These are our growth projections by, by um, grade level that we look at and tells us, you know, where we are and, and what the numbers look like. And basically what you'll see here is um, we don't really change a whole lot um, for each kindergarten class. Basically we take the previous kindergarten class and a little bit added to it and look at birth rates and, and get to a, a 10 year forecast. So you can see that in the year uh, 2021, 2020-2021, um, this is with, with our COVID numbers, what we're expecting to still grow is about 2%, which is 604 kids. Um, and so that's, that's about what we've been doing, and you can see where it's forecasted out moving, moving forward. Um, and then we do it by school. 
Here's, here was our original projection that we had for 2021. Um, and then we also have the, have the COVID numbers that play into that. So then the next slide is um, we talk about the impact of COVID to what our numbers are going to be. We think that we may slow a little bit in growth, but that we may end up keeping um, some of the kids that used to move out, be in different areas. So while we used to always gain some and lose some, we may gain less and lose less, so we still end up having a net gain overall. Um, so here's some of the takeaways. You guys talked about this. I'm not going to get into to most of that, but I wanted you guys to kind of have an idea. I'll pull, go back to this map um, here of, of where most of our housing developments are um, and, and where all of our school construction is really taking place. Currently, we're building the, the new Denton High School replacement campus uh, north of University and west of Monty Bray, east of I-35, pretty close to where the outlet mall is on I-35 in Denton. Um, we're currently in a complete rebuild of Wilson Elementary School. So um, that's taking place right now, which is in the core of Denton as well. Strickland Middle School is also in a rebuild. Um, Ryan High School and Gower High School are completely uh, torn up right now. So if you've gone through there and tried to get into the parking lots, you can forget it. Um, we're in the, the, the middle of renovations and additions there. Um, out east, um, we're looking at expansion to Braswell High School. The future construction of elementary 25 and middle school number nine will also be out east um, in the Braswell zone. Um, and that's, that's gonna keep our construction team busy. Um, we are in the middle of about $440 million worth of projects that are going on right now. And, and frankly, while um, school has not been in session, it's, it's allowed us to get ahead on some of the uh, major maintenance things we had to work through. But um, if by looking at this map, in the red areas, um, you, can, you can see where there's a lot of groundwork underway um, and exactly where the growth areas are um, within, within, the, within the system and the district. And, um, if you ever need any help or want any, any uh, information about any of this, um, you can call up to our offices. We have a communications team that has maps and uh, attendance zones and, and different things from that to help you with any of that. So um, I didn't want to give you just a ton of data, so I, I've really trimmed this down. There's a lot more in other places, um, but I can share this with you after next Tuesday when we do our formal presentation with the board. So that being said, I hope I would between all you guys and lunch. Um, because I made a reference to, to Mary's um, Cafe. I'm sure it made everybody uh, a little hungry from that standpoint. So um, any questions or anything I can, uh, I can answer for you guys? I uh, see lots of thank yous. And uh, here's a question, question for you. Let me toss this one out real quick and we'll move back to you. Um, this question says, are there plans still going forward to resume live classes in the fall? Yes, absolutely. So let me just tell you that, that your crystal ball is as good as mine. Um, I think our families most definitely need to have their kids back in school. Our economy needs to have our kids back in school. It's not just our current economy. It's our future economy that needs our kids back in school. So I know people get really um, – focused on the right now part, which I totally understand. Um, the future economy is contingent upon our children getting back in school face to face um, and getting that level of instruction that we know they need. There may be a time in all of our futures where kids can learn remotely at the same level that they can learn with a face to face teacher. Um, but the advancements just are not there yet. And the data doesn't show that, that that's, that's the way kids learn best. Um, we will do and have a plan for whatever happens. Um, because here's what I can tell you. If we require kids to wear masks, people are unhappy. If we don't require kids to wear masks, people are unhappy. If we require teachers to wear masks, people are unhappy. If we don't require teachers to wear masks, people are unhappy. So I can tell you, we are going to do what's reasonable. Um, matter of fact, today, during this call, I have, I'm having, hosting a meeting here in my, in my house with, um, seven area superintendents. Um, so if you guys know my wife, Melanie, she, if y'all see her, tell her thank you for making lunch for everyone today, right? But we've been working all day trying to get on the same page for what that looks like in the fall. Um, 
it's it's a it's a huge question mark, and I really do wish I had better answers and more things that were anchored and steadfast to put your your foot down on. This is the way it's going to be, um, but we just don't know. If we continue to see the trends like we're seeing, um, I feel really good about us moving forward with some some things in place that I think we'll do differently, which makes some sense, right? Um, but to think that we're going to have five year olds and six year olds and say, we're going to be able to social distance and they're gonna wear a shield on their face. Um, I wore glasses as a kindergarten student, first grade student. And I can assure you, every time my mother saw me, she was cleaning my glasses. If you've had young children, you know exactly what that's like. So um, I, don't, I don't know exactly what it'll look like. I can tell you this, um, whatever it is, we'll make it great. Um, we had graduations two weeks ago at the Texas Motor Speedway, and all I've had is, can we do it that way every year? And I'm like, a negative ghost rider. We're not doing that every year. <laughs> we are ready to move to the next thing. Um, but I, I, um, I think we will transform. I think some good things will come, and we'll learn how to do some things better. Um, and I, I, but the number one thing I think everybody recognizes is um, our, our kids need to have the professional educators uh, they need face-to-face -face time together. They need to be with other people their age for development purposes. There's just a lot that goes into having school um, in a face-to-face -face environment. So unless somebody somewhere tells me absolutely not, um, we're planning on face-to-face -face, um, with some safeguards in place to make those things happen. So um, we've been through, we've been through uh, illness pandemics before. If you remember, we had a shutdown a few years back because of the swine flu. It was all short term. Um, but you know, what we're hearing is very positive. So, so we're looking forward to, to get back to as close to normal as possible. Is that the best non-answer answer ever? <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> very well. Yes. And, and, you know, through the, evasive answer i'll yeah. say lots of positivity to be read in between the lines there absolutely we are absolutely. very grateful thank you, you bet. and a kind of a tie on to that one i've heard rumbles of the sports and the bands and so forth are already kind of getting fired back up give us a little update there absolutely so all of our athletic teams and fine arts folks that can do things outside um, we're starting those back up on Monday and we're really trying to be intentional and, and do a little at a time. Um, and so uh, you, you have to really give our state leadership some credit. Um, if you're going to give them blame for things, you have to give them some credit whenever you start trying to do things a little at a time. No matter, no matter who you are or where you are, somebody somewhere is going to think you're going too fast, right? Um, but what we will do is we're going to do things just a little at a time, spreading kids out, and what we've learned about COVID is that it's really a, a, a droplets and a respiratory um, transmission. Um, our early understandings about it being on surfaces and living on surfaces for long periods of time, that may not necessarily be the case. So when you start talking about that being how it's transmitted, and that's the way that it thrives, then we have to really think through about where we allow kids to get together and and start breathing really heavy and, and, and having those vapors out into the world. And um, so we're moving forward first with outside um, with some really distant ways where you're not standing in line with somebody in front of you with your hands on your shorts, you know, breathing on everybody. Right. So we're, we're working through some of those guidelines and we're just doing a little at a time. Um, so our football kids and our outdoor sports kids, they're already working and moving forward. Those are the fall pieces. I'm getting a little thing from our volleyball and basketball and, and those kinds of folks. But again, inside is different than outside. And if, if it's the same thing with our restaurants, right? The, the restaurants now go outside, do what you need to do. We're, we're the same way with as kids start getting back into things, not trying to rush too fast because nobody wants to go, go so fast that you shut everything down for a couple more weeks and not have that at all. So that's where we are with that too. Great. Thank you. Okay. And I think we had a verbal question try to come through a bit ago and I, I may have cut you off. You did. Sorry, Matt. Okay. No, that's fine. <laughs> just letting y'all know. I'm just, 
Dr. Wilson, I'm still cleaning my glasses after yes. all these two years, right? Uh, hey, I was wanting to know, Dr. Wilson, would there be a way this year, if y'all feel that it's applicable that we can do this, could we go on a tour of the new high school sometime later on this year, you know, as a group from the board membership? Absolutely. Whenever, let us get a little bit further um, into the fall, for sure. Let it cool off a little bit. Um, if you if you go to dittonisd.org right now, you can see the aerials from the drone footage um, and begin to work through some of those things. But we will put some things together in the fall um, to begin piecing all that together for everyone. It'll be it'll be it'll be really really exciting. Um, in addition to that, um, we we've already moved into our our new ag science facilities even before we have it all constructed because we've got a piece of property out on the eastern section of the district that already had some improvements on it. So we have um, 18 head of cattle and sheep and all kinds of things for kids this summer, which is fantastic because we haven't really had anything in that section of the district to begin um, working through that ag program and developing that ag program. So I'd like to do both of those. I'd like to get the, the ag science piece going in one section at one time and then also do the new high school another time. Perfect. Thank you. you okay, any other questions, team? All right. Any last words of advice, Mike, Nancy? Okay, well, we appreciate you all being here today. Wonderful, wonderful meeting. Great up-to-date information, and thanks, Mike, to reaching out to some of our uh, economists and, and pulling everything together for us in a nice realtor thought process. We're so thankful for you, and we look forward to helping um, both our Texas realtor family as well as our Denton Independent School District, Dr. Wilson, getting back into the groove of things. Thank you all so very much. Thank Have you. a fabulous weekend. Thank you.